awesome. You guys excited today? We're excited to feel the presence of the Lord with us today. We know he is here, and he wants to do a work in your life. And a couple of things I just want to share with you guys real quick uh, on the bulletin. And if you didn't get one, please get one in the back. But number one is next Sunday there's an important business meeting we need you all to be here for. And uh, it'll be in the church body members voting on, on Pastor Rodney. And so we're excited about it. And, uh, and also we, we are doing I Love My Church Weekend. And we have a bunch of questions because we're going to be playing Family Feud. So we have a bunch of questions we need your answers to. And uh, it's here in your bulletin. If you would just follow that and turn your answers in, it's going to be a lot of fun. And we truly here love our church, amen, and we're excited about what's taking place. The other thing I'm going to bring up is how many people here are golfers? Well, I'm not, but I love golf. <laughs> well, we're having our second annual golf tournament. We're raising funds for Streams of Hope and the Missions and a wonderful work going on in the Philippines. So spread the word. Get people who are golfers to come out and sign up, and we'll have a great time. It was a great time uh, last year as well. So with that, we're going to open up with some prayer and let the Lord just start moving in our hearts. Father, we just come to you this morning and are so excited to see the next step that you have taken. Lord, I know, and we've seen, even from the search committee, we've seen you move step by step in this whole process. And, Lord, our confidence is in you. And so, Lord, this morning I pray that you would just till the soil of our hearts. Lord, that as the seed of your word would fall upon it, Lord, it would cause growth in our life and fruit in our lives. And so, Lord, this morning as we come before you, let us just praise you in spirit and truth. Let us just thank you for all the wonderful things that you have done. And Lord, I just pray this morning you truly would just open up the eyes of our heart. Let us see things as you do, Lord. Let us love people as you do. And so, Lord, we ask you to move amongst us. We give you this service in your honor and for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you.
singing with you guys last week. It's great to sing with a church who can really sing. Amen. So let's sing Great Are You, Lord, because He is great. Amen.
Amen. Praise the Lord, man. Wasn't that an amazing time of worship together? Praise God. Well, church, this morning, we're going to dismiss the kids to junior church. So if you're here this morning, children, you want to go hang out in junior church, make your way to the back. we got our workers out there going to take you and let you have a great time this morning and learn about Jesus. Amen. Isn't it awesome that we have people and volunteers that have worked to take your children out, let them hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Give those people a hand, huh? Amen? I don't know if you've worked with little kids or not. I taught them once, and I said, I'll do the high school junior high stuff. <laughs> that stuff's crazy. So, well, this morning, um, the search committee uh, has put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of prayer, a lot of meetings. The search committee say amen. <laughs> a lot of meetings. Um, but in that effort to, to seek out God's will, for the man of God that he would bring to be the pastor at Grace Baptist Church. And through that process, uh, we are uh, happy and honored to present this morning to you Pastor Rodney Love. He comes to us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he's going to come this morning. He's going to preach for us, and uh, we are excited. So, Pastor Rodney, you come. Good to go. All right, here we go. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. My name is Rodney Love. I have a pleasure of being with my family again as well. My wife, Angela, is here. My youngest son, Caleb, and my daughter, Michaela, are with us. My oldest is back in Philadelphia or Philadelphia area. Now, we say Philadelphia. If you're from there, they would tell you I'm not from Philly. I live in the suburbs. And so, uh, but we are from that part of the world. And I will say you've already had more snow yesterday than we've had the entire year. We've had no snow. It's one of the great winters we've had so far, and uh, I am not upset about leaving snow. Uh, but I want to start off, I mentioned this this morning and the time we had earlier, but I'm going to say this again in front of everybody. I want to say a big thank you to the search committee and the elders who have worked tirelessly in this process. It is not an easy process, and uh, you have a lot of different things that have happened, just the weight just the weight of the meetings and finding the right person and knowing you're participating in that. And uh, I, tell you, I had a chance to meet with them and talk with them. And you've got a godly crew that have worked hard and dedicated. And I just want to say thank you to them. And uh, they, they speak volumes about your church. And they say a lot about who you are as a church. And I, I appreciate it. And I'm excited to be with you here today. If you have your Bibles, we're in the book of Luke chapter 8 this morning. Luke chapter 8. 
Now, yeah, let me give you a little bit of a background of what happens when people are in my position. What we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to go find the best message we've preached in the last three years and pull that out, all right? Because we're on trial this morning. That's what we're told, okay? Yeah, let's see if he's any good. That's what I've been told. No. So I did not do that, by the way. So you may find that out by the end. I spent a bunch of time in prayer over the last few weeks. And there is a section of scripture. There's actually two different stories in the section we're going to look at. We're only going to look at one of them today. And let me tell you my ultimate goal. Number one, I want to encourage you. I believe that Jesus and the Bible have answers to everything we deal with today. Amen? The world thinks they do, and then we find out, unfortunately, they do not. And I don't believe they're found in a preacher. Strangely, not even in a church. I think they're found in the Word of God. And a church that honors the Word of God will be honored by God. So I want to, I think there's some answers. I hope to encourage you today, but I want to challenge us a little bit in this idea of faith. Uh, you as a church, I, uh, the group, the search committees told me something, and I, I'm just going to tell you a little bit from an outsider's point of view. I've been told that the church has grown since the last pastor has left. That almost never happens. That, let me tell you what that means. That means the core that was here was just on fire for God and still moving. That's a healthy church. A church should not come and go based upon who stands right here. A church is the people, amen? And we're, we're just one of them. We're just part of that. Hopefully to lead and encourage and to love, that's what we strive to do and to teach from the word of God. But this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit longer. I'm going to read all that entails these two stories, and we're going to focus predominantly on the second one. So Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 40. The Bible says, So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed of any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flood, blow, flood of blow stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good cheer, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Father, we pray this morning that as we look into the Word of God, that you'd allow us to the best of our abilities to set aside the distractions of the day. I would assume that there are many who have come into this room with weights on their shoulders, with things that, Lord, they know they have to pick back up when they leave, and maybe just coming looking for an answer from you. Father, maybe some have been dealing with it for a while, and Lord, our desire today through your Word is to see you. So I pray, Father, that you would give me the words to say, only the ones you want, nothing more, nothing less. Help me to know what you want. Lord, we preach to you. We desire that everyone would see you and hear from you today. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that could not say that they are for sure that they are on their way to heaven, that they are saved, that maybe even today would be that day that they would call upon you for salvation. We look to you for help. We look to you for grace. And we look to you to bring your power and your Holy Spirit in this place. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. You ever wanted something so bad, you just couldn't stop thinking about it? Remember when you were young and you were looking forward to Christmas, and now it's birthdays, but you wanted something so bad, it brought you great excitement. You know, one of the things that I believe is true of the Christian journey is that God has something great for each and every one of us. Uh, throughout the years in ministry, I've had people off say, well, I'm not like that person, or I'm not as good as that person. Can I challenge you? You're not to be like anybody else. God's made you just like you with all of the strengths and all of the weaknesses that come with it. He's made you just the way you are on purpose, and he's got a plan for you. But you know, I, I think many of us would say sometimes it feels like that plan isn't going the way we expected it to. I, 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 for me, I, I have a tendency, I don't know if it's just because I'm a guy or if it's just me, but I like to be in control of things. You know, my wife gets on my case, we'll get in the car and I'll use a GPS. 
you, all you men know that we have a better way than the GPS, right? So we'll get close. My wife goes, are you just going to obey the GPS or are you just going to do your own thing? Well, we all know the answer to that one too. And she goes, you got lost. No, I just found a better way. We never get lost. Only men in this day can get lost with GPSs, right? But, you know, it's funny when you look at that. I wish that it was just that easy. Follow and go this way. But sometimes in our Christian journey, we think we're heading this way. This is where we believe God's going to take us, and we're heading. But it just seems like there's roadblocks. It seems like things aren't going the way we hoped they would. It seems like things sometimes are just falling apart. And you say, what's going on, Lord? And if you're not careful, you can easily begin to say, Lord, have you forgotten about me? But you know, then we go to passages like the book of James, where James says, count it joy when you find yourself in numerous trials and temptations. And then we say, Lord, you told us to do that, but I just don't know how that's possible. Then we go back to Peter, where Peter says, don't, don't consider it strange concerning the fiery trials which are to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. And we look at this and we say, Lord, sometimes it just doesn't make sense how things or why things are ending up the way they are. You see, from the human standpoint, at least this is my perspective, I think that if we get this idea, if we can just change our circumstances, everything will solve itself. If, if all the bills are paid and everybody's healthy and the arguments have been won or lost or whatever... We can deal with the guilt of our past and overcome loneliness. If we can just fix these, then we'll be okay. And that's what the world tells us. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Because it seems like once you take care of one, you know, just like the next day, here comes another one. Let me tell you, just fixing one problem will not solve our struggles. Because God desires so much more for us than that. He wants more for our life than just getting through day to day or just solving a problem. I want you to consider a story of Job. I've been doing a study through that for a couple of weeks. And there's so many things in the book of Job that intrigue me. One, you know, one, we get the chance to go behind the curtain, as it were, and see Satan and God argue in heaven. And the whole time Job's dealing with this, he doesn't know about what's taking place. And then he's got three friends, if you want to call them that, that come to be an encouragement to him. But one phrase has stuck with me as I was reading it about three weeks ago. Job had just lost all of his wealth. Now, if you know, don't know the story, he was the wealthiest man of his day. And usually that's found in servants and in, and in animals and cattle. And in one day, in a matter of moments, different people came up and said he just lost everything. People had stolen or killed all of his livelihood. He was gone from being wealthy to basically broke. And as he's dealing with the information, someone comes and says that all of his children were in a house, the wind has blown it down, and now all his children are dead. And I look at that, and I'm like, how, how could he? But that's still not what caught my attention. What caught my attention is while Job was we weeping, there's something the Bible says that Job did. The Bible says Job worshipped God. And I look at that, and I'm like, How? And here's what the Lord taught me. Job's relationship with God transcended his circumstances. Job didn't see God good because he would give him stuff. Job saw God good because God was good. Everything else was extra. If you have the wrong view of God, circumstances can become very confusing and frustrating. But when you see God as God outside of all of that, you get to see what God is trying to do. So what I want to do is, as we look at this passage before us, I want to look at a lady. There's two stories. There's a man, Jairus. He's trying to get, his, to get Jesus back. And please understand, Jairus shouldn't have done this. He's the ruler of the synagogue. They weren't big fans of Jesus. And as they're going, there's this huge crowd of people. And that whole story of Jairus by itself is amazing. But in the process of this crowd of people crowding around Jesus, all of a sudden, Jesus stops. I can imagine for Jairus, that was frustrating. He comes to a stop and he says, wait, somebody's touched me. This is where getting to know the people of Scripture amazed me. This is where Peter just shows his intelligence. All right? All right. He's walking with God. And God's, someone's touched me. And Peter goes, um, I'm not sure if he went to Thomas and said, should I tell him this? You know, he talks to Jesus. A lot of people are touching you. He totally missed the lesson. And Jesus goes, I know. But I have felt power come out. You know one intri intriguing thing about that story is, of all the people touching Jesus, only one had power come. What was it? 
What was it that made her story so different? And that's what I want to look at this morning. The things that made this story so different. And I believe this, our struggles may be the things that will bring us to God. Three things. Let's look, number one, at the frustrations of life. The frustrations of life. Verse 83 says, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians could not be healed of any. The first thing we see is she struggled with the disease. Now, without going into a lot of detail, this was just a bleeding problem and it, it could not be controlled. It was not her fault. It was a medical condition. But this condition brought with it all kinds of other struggles. Just one. I mean, you think about the physical, the anemia, and all the other things that would come with it. But in the Middle Eastern day, there's another thing that came with it. She would have been considered unclean. So she would have been told to stay away. Just imagine the loneliness her condition brought, brought her. The loneliness. Maybe the fear. Will I ever be able to overcome this? Will this be the thing that will kill me? The extent of the struggle went way beyond the disease, and that's sometimes true. The extent of our condition is more than just the circumstances, but all the other things that come with it. But you know, number two, uh, the second thing here is her disease made her desperate. She was struggling with something which she had no control over. Some struggles sometimes are simply out of our own making. We make bad decisions. We go the wrong way. Can I tell you, aren't you glad that God doesn't just get angry and throw us off when we make bad decisions? Amen. I'm glad that God is willing always, when we turn around, he's always there. I, I've had people for years come and tell me their view of God. Here's their view of God. If I mess up once, God's waiting to strike me down with lightning and to ruin my life. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not Jehovah God. You know who the God of the Bible is? If you go to another story, it's a story of what we often call the prodigal son. Here's a part of that story. The prodigal son had left, he'd embarrassed his father, humiliated him in the cultural area, and now his father, his son's coming home covered in filth, he'd been in a pigsty for an extended period of time, but that's not, again, the key. You see the father in this story, who is a picture of God. He's on the front porch, as it were, waiting for him to come. There's an intriguing part where the Bible says that the God or the father ran to his son. Men in those days didn't run. One of the reasons, they would have had a really huge robe. So he would have had to pick up his robe and run in absolute humiliation to the boy that the world would have said had dishonored him. Filthy. And he runs and he holds him and he hugs him. This is the God of the Bible that we can come. So sometimes our struggles are our own making. And you know what God says? Come unto me. Just come. Just turn and come back. But sometimes these things are outside of our control and require intervention from God. Her condition was real, and it was extreme. She has sought out everyone in her world to fix it. Did you catch this? She had gone to every doctor possible to find an answer. And while the world and today has some answers for some things we struggle with, doesn't have the answer for everything. The real problems we face, the real answers we need, they're not found in the world. They're found in God's Word. And we get, the world is lost. They're constantly trying to find new ways to find answers for questions that no one's been able to answer, but the questions are in God's Word. It was real. So our struggles may be real, but their solutions are only found in Christ. Let's go to number two, the faith of a believer. The faith of a believer. I'm going to go back to verse number 44. He came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her blood, her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus says, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of faith. Number one, her faith was simple. She wasn't looking for a lot of Jesus' attention. As a matter of fact, she probably didn't even want to be noticed. She was being as quiet as she could for a lot of the reasons, the culture reasons, all the other things, but it was just simple. She was afraid maybe if she'd been spotted, somebody would have taken her out and said, you need to leave the area. She just wanted to be invisible, but she was so convinced that the power of this Jesus that all she had to do was touch him. It wasn't Jesus, it was the faith that brought the healing through Jesus. Because a lot of people touched it. It was her faith that had activated 
what Jesus wanted to do. Please understand, Jesus knew this was all going to happen. You know that, right? He really wasn't surprised when he said, who touched me? He was trying to draw everybody's attention to this now healed woman. He was aware of all of this. When Jairus inevitably is over there, overwhelmed, his daughter's dying, and this Jesus doesn't really seem to care. At least that's how you could see it. He's pointing out attention to someone who didn't want to be seen. Because Jesus wanted them to learn some things. It's one of the greatest lessons on faith. God simply teaches us that faith alone, simple faith is really all that is needed. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In verse 6 of chapter 12 of Hebrews, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Faith is just needs to be that simple. I love another passage, Matthew 17, 20. I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here and to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. You know, inevitably, whatever you're facing is without a doubt, looks like what the Bible calls a mountain, impossible to do anything with. And you're facing it, and you're like, there's nothing I can do. And God is saying, the answer is really found in really simple faith. Can I start with this and understand a simple faith? Simple faith does start at salvation. It's not a church thing. It's not a religious thing. I tell my church often, I've said this when I preach, I'm not a big fan of the term religion. See, religion is a man-made system to get you to conform to a church's belief. I believe in a relationship with Jesus. That this transcends all of that. And so I come in simple faith. And it's, I mean, it's just as simple as a small of a mustard seed. I'm going to give you a, a simple illustration of this. The Bible tells us that when we come to Jesus, we must come with the faith of a child. Now, I've always told my kids I won't embarrass them in church. So I'm going to talk about the one who's not here, okay? So <laughs> when we were, uh, he was young. He must have been about seven or eight at this point, my oldest. We were working on the roof of a trailer we were living on at the church at the time. And he and I were up and down the ladder. I don't remember what we were working on. So we, he, he was helping, and he really was doing a good job. We're up and down the ladder. And so as we're coming down, um, he was handing me stuff. And at some point, you understand, when you're seven, your dad is the greatest, strongest, best looking, I added that part, best guy, right? He is the best. He can do anything. He can beat up every other dad, right? You know what I'm talking about. Well, he proved that. So he's on the roof, and I'm laying down a bucket, and I hear from behind me, Dad, catch. And I turn around, and I'm looking to catch a broom or a shovel, and I see an eight-year-old flying through the air. He's like, whoa. You know what I saw? One, the the elation on his face of how awesome this was. You know what I thought? This is going to hurt. A lot. And he's, whoa! And the problem was, I wasn't under him. So I kick things out, and I I catch him, and we fall to the ground. He falls on me. I fall to the ground. And I'm laying there. And there are things in my body that hurt I didn't know existed at that point. And what does he do? That's great! Let's do it again! (laughs) My loving wife was nice enough through her laughter to pull him off the ladder as I lay on the ground. She made sure I was okay before she chuckled at it. But I'm laying there, Now, that's such simple faith. He was lucky that I actually caught him that time. Now, he's 22, a little bigger than me. He's not doing that anymore, is he? He's like, Dad, I got you. That's where it goes now. Dad, I got you. That is simple. But that is the faith that Jesus wants us to have in him. See, he jumped off with abandon because he was convinced dad's got this. We should be able to live our life with abandon in faith because God has this. He's got it solved. He hasn't told you how yet, but he's got it solved. You just got to keep going until he lets you see what it is. You say, why doesn't he tell me right now? Well, he told us in scripture, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You ever used a lamp to go long distance? You only get about 10 feet. God gives you what you need for today. And then tomorrow, he'll give you what you need for tomorrow. We get so overwhelmed and consumed about next month and next year. God says, just stay with me today. I've got next year. I know what's coming. I know all of these things. But you know, his faith is not only simple. Her faith was persistent. 
Consider the situation. She's attempting to get to Jesus through all these people. After all she went through to just get to this point. And all these people in her way. She could have just said, you know what? This is not an option. He's never going to see me. But she was convinced if I could just touch him. How does that translate for us? Keep praying when you feel like maybe he's not listening. He is. Keep faithful when you feel like you're at your end. Keep trusting when it seems like it's getting worse. And keep expecting because God desires to move on your behalf and he will. At some point, he will move. I want to read a section of scripture, Luke chapter 11, verse 9. Paul, uh, Luke says this, or Jesus is saying this, so I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see that? If we, as sinful people, can love our children, how much more does God love us? Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Her faith was persistent. You ever wonder why it is that God doesn't just answer right away? Don't you wish he would? My dad said the other day, because when I get to heaven, I'm going to just tell God, a simple email would have been fine. Just something. God doesn't, though. For years, I used to try and figure that out as I was learning about God. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use another homespun illustration, but this one, it just is a great reminder. Years ago, I, it's the same son. I can still pick on him. He, we were going out uh, to Lowe's or something to get... and. He came, he goes, can I go? Now, you have to understand when we, the, the breakup of our family. If my wife goes to get something, she goes to get something. When I go to get something, I go all over the world. Where do I go to? Wow, I go get ice cream. And so if my kids go with me, you know what they know they're getting? They're going to get something. My wife goes, you can come and see Lowe's. With me, it's like we're going to go get a feast. That's how they see it, all right? So that's just because I'm weak. That's all there is to it. <laughs> So my son, I said, do you want to go with us? And he got a smile on his face. He knows what that means. So he jumps in the back of the car. Now, you have to understand, if I invited my kids, I fully intended to take them somewhere. But I'm not sharing that secret. So as we're getting down the road closer, he comes to the back, Dad, can I get some ice cream? And I go back, why? Why should I get you ice cream? Well, Dad, because I've been a good kid. Well, I'm not Santa Claus. That doesn't matter. I, why should I get you ice cream? And then he gets smart because you're the strongest and smartest, right? He really gets smart. They know how to play it. And I'm like, well, I know I am. Thank you. You know, that's true. And, and he's sitting there and he's trying to figure it out. He knows there's a magic phrase. He goes, I know, Dad, because I love you. You know what? We're going to every ice cream shop in town. <laughs> you know, I, Sometimes God wants us to be persistent because the type of relationship we have in those times is sweet. And God just says, you know, I'll take care of it. Stay here. I just love the time we have together. And we need that. You know, it's okay just to sit down before God and just say, this hurts, this stinks, and I'm, I don't know what to do. I'll never forget, wasn't that a few years ago, I'm on the floor bawling. I'm like, Lord, I don't know why you're allowing this to happen. I was angry. You know what I learned from that? God didn't say, how dare you? You know what God said? It's okay. I know it hurts, but I'm here. That's the persistent faith. God's going to take care of it, but we need to trust and stick with it. But number three, her faith was rewarded. Simple, persistent faith is what God rewards. I believe this true faith will bring you to Christ and expect, and then you can expect great things from him. It starts with salvation. A simple faith in Jesus as the only God. Not another option. Not just religion. Not just one of the things I do. But just turning from all of the emptiness of the world and putting my faith wholly and completely and simply on Jesus alone. And John, he says, he is the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus says. 
And if you're here today and you can't say, could you say for sure that if something were to happen this week and your life were to end, you'd be in heaven? I didn't ask you if you've been baptized or church or gone to church. Can you say you know for sure? God tells us in 1 John, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know, know that ye have eternal life. You can have that today. Let's go to number three. There's the freedom through healing. The freedom through healing. Verse number 47. Now when the woman saw she was not hidden, she came trembling, falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good, come, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She had been freed from the bondage of her disease. When we come to Christ, we learn what true freedom looks like. I love the verse that's on the screen, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God never said that there won't be battles in life. God didn't even say that the Christian journey was going to eliminate your problems. Frankly, you're fighting Satan now. There's going to be some added. But he says, you come. My yoke is there, but it's easy. My burden is light. He said, I, I'm, I can give you that strength, and I can do it through you. I'm not going to make you do it. I will do it for you and through you. And so what does he say? Come to me, all you who are overwhelmed, all who are confused, all who just are hurt, all who are maybe a little angry, all who say, I've heard every other answer to heaven, and I'm looking for the truth. Come to me. This freedom starts at the cross for salvation. There's no magical religious answer. It's simply relationship with Jesus. And this freedom continues in life through Christ. It doesn't mean that life problems are going to disappear. It just means you're not alone in the midst of it. I didn't write this scripture down. Um, I, I forgot to write it down in my notes, so I can't give you the exact one. But there's another section in scripture in Matthew, it's a little later in the context, in, in, the, in the line of time of Christ. And the story simply states, there's not a lot behind it. Because I asked the question to begin with, what is it that everybody touched Jesus but she got? And no one told her this would work. She just believed it. Later on, there's a story, Jesus comes out, a crowd comes around him, and people start touching the hem of his garment. You know what the Bible says? They were healed. Makes you wonder where they heard that, Right? It's amazing how God can even use her pain to reach others. God can use that. God wants to. He's got a plan for you. He knows you like no one else. I love one of the phrases in the song today. He knows my heart and he still loves me. That is so powerful. I'm glad that God's not expecting perfection. God's not coming down waiting for me to mess up. God just loves me as I am. And then he strives to make me more like his son. That's what he desires to do. I'm going to finish with a couple thoughts, and then we'll go to time of invitation. First of all, could you say you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? If not, you can actually get that taken care of this morning. I'm not, we're not going to embarrass you, although I'll tell you, there is nothing better than the decision to come to Jesus. It's the greatest decision you will ever make. In a moment, we'll give you a chance to be able to do that. Second question, are there things you say, Lord, I'm hurting, I'm confused, I'm tired. Maybe today you need to come to the altar and give those things to Jesus. You'll probably have to do it again tomorrow, but today's a great day to do it. And just say, Lord, I'm hurt. I don't get it. Help me to see you in the midst of this. Help me to keep my faith simple, persistent, and strong, and just keep seeking you. He's there, and he wants to be your help. Father, we love you. We thank you for the wonderful time you've given to us today to look into your word. I'm grateful that the word of God, Lord, has so life-changing truths, but yet also so practical to the things we face today. Lord, it was my desire as you laid upon my heart to be an encouragement this morning, and I hope I was able to do that. I pray, Father, that you would speak through your word today. I pray if there's anyone here that is not sure they're saved, they may even have a list of questions, but not sure they're saved, that even today would be the day that they would call upon you for salvation. I pray for others who are carrying a burden, who are just hurting or whatever it would be that maybe today, like this lady, they would just come and give it to you. 
Just come and give it to you. Just, just a touch. If they can just get a touch of Jesus, they can change their lives. And maybe today they need to come and just kneel at your feet and ask you to do what only you can do. I pray, Father, you'll do what I cannot. I cannot change lives. I can just teach. And I pray, Lord, you'll move where I've ended and you will continue what you've already started and speak and work in our hearts. I pray you work in these few moments in Jesus' name. With your head bowed, nice closed, please. No one looking around, just for a moment in this room to give a bit of privacy if we can. I want to ask this first question. Could you say for sure that you know that you're on your way to heaven? If not, you know you can know that. Please understand, that that's not meaning come get baptized. That's not meaning joining a church. Those are great things, but that's down the road. I'm asking you, are you today willing to learn what it means from God's word to simply trust in Jesus? Please understand, we're not going to give you the Baptist position. We're going to give you God's word. You want, you want to know what God says about heaven? This is a chance. I want to know. I just want a chance to pray with you. I'm not going to call you out. I promise. Head bowed and eyes closed. If that's you today, we just love to know if you're here. I promise we're not going to call you out. You say, Pastor, would you just pray for me? I'm not sure. Just lift your hand up. Put it right back down. I'm not sure. Would you pray for me this morning, Pastor? Anybody like that here today? Second question. Are there things that you just need to give to him? Things you just need to come? Maybe think God's moving you to make some steps of faith in your life and you say, Lord, I need your strength. God moves in ways I can't. He's spoken to you in the way he wanted you to hear today. In a moment, the worship team's going to lead us in a song and I encourage you to spend some time. Come to the altar. Spend time with God. You say, I don't know if I could do that. Then just maybe kneel at your pew or your chair. Whatever it be in this time. Don't leave keeping a hold of these things. I promise you no one's going to laugh. This is what we're doing here. This is the point, to come and give this to Jesus. If that's you today, I encourage you to come and give it to him. Father, as we come to this time, I pray you'll work in our hearts. May we respond as you'd have us to. May we give it to you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together with me. Just before we sing, I want to give a moment just while we're silent. If you want to take some time with God, some music playing in the background, but if that's you, you want to spend some time with God, the altar's open, I encourage you to come. Just come and kneel here, give it to Him, whatever it would be. Just spend some time down there. You need some strength, you need some answers, you just need to be honest with God, whatever it be. Just take some time down here. This is what we're doing here. This is why we're here.